Welcome to the program. I'm Tim Walker, pastor of Church Alive in Cleveland, Ohio, and we are so thrilled that you have joined us today. We have a tremendous panel of seasoned pastors that are here from a variety of backgrounds, and they are ready to answer your questions from a biblical perspective. So I want to encourage you to send those questions to us at ask at tct.tv. Now also remember, we are live on YouTube. And so all you've got to do is go to YouTube, find our feed, post your question in the comment section. It will come directly to me. We'll get an answer from these pastors today. We want to take a moment to thank Dr. Garth and Tina Kuntz for 45 years of leading this great network with such vision and integrity. We also want to thank all of our partners, those that pray for us, those that watch TCT on a regular basis, and those that so generously into this ministry. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We are so grateful. Well, let's meet today's pastors. First of all, we have Dr. Kathleen Wupio from Living Through Him Ministries in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Next, we have Pastor David Gray from First Baptist Church of Garrettsville in Garrettsville, Ohio. Also joining us today is Apostle Diane Chappelle, from Visions of Hope Fellowship in Detroit, Michigan. Next, we have Pastor Mark Columbus from Awakening Church in Aurora, Ohio. And finally, we have Pastor Luana Williams from the Kingdom Connection in Cleveland, Ohio. Pastors, thank you for being with us today and welcome to the program. Uh, Dr. Kathleen, we, ha we already have a question that has come in from Florence in Iowa. And Florence, thank you for sending your question. And Florence wants to know, what does the word Hosanna mean? Okay, thank you so much for that, Florence. And uh, I was just looking at a scripture here, you know, and actually Hosanna means adoration and praise and joy and, uh, you know, just ha almost like hallelujah. Remember when they were just during... Um, you know, when Jesus Palm Sunday and they were just throwing the palms down and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, you know what? I think that um, they kind of got goofed up a little bit because, I mean, at that time, here we find Jesus hanging on a cross later on, right? And I think they thought he's come to save us in sometimes a forceful way. I mean, it's a beautiful uh, way of praise, our deliverer. But I want to look at John 18 in verse 10. This is a little bit different, but it says, then, Simon Peter, here we are at the cross, right? Having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servants and cut his ear off. And the servant's name was Malchus. And said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which thou drinkest, my father has given me, shall I not drink it? And so, you know, I was just looking at that and I was just thinking, you know, they're saying our Savior and so many times they had really messed up with that because they thought, well, we're going to, he's going to establish the kingdom here right now on earth. But it really means praise and like hallelujah and adoration. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen. Pastor Gray, uh, what can you add to the meaning of the word Hosanna? She's really nailed what that word means. And it's a wonderful scene that we see Jesus being, the, the, everyone shouting Hosanna and she's, he's coming into the city on the, the foal of an ass and he, he's there and he's riding and all of these people are cutting down palm branches in a symbolic gesture and throwing their coats down and in he comes to the city and they were just shouting how wonderful he was and Hosanna, we adore you, we love you, we praise you, we thank God that you are here at this time and a week later. And a week later, he was nailed to the cross and some of the people that were in that crowd were in the crowd that watched him die. So we don't get too tied up with what people are saying about us today because God has a future for us. Thank you, Pastor Gray. Uh, Apostle Chappelle, um, what, what can you add to the meaning of the word Hosanna? I think both uh, Dr. Kathleen and Pastor Gray have pretty much covered it. Uh, that reference scripture in Matthew 21, uh, verse 9, uh, the crowds went ahead of him and those who followed him were shouting, uh, shouting in praise and adoration, Hosanna. In the, to the son of David, blessed, praised, glorified. Uh, um, comments refers to his name. 
uh, Hosanna in the highest heaven. And also in Psalm 118, 26, it says, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, we have blessed you from the house from the, of the Lord, you who come into his sanctuary under his guardianship. And that's a reference from Mark 11, 9, and 10. So those two scriptures really encapsulate what they have just uh, said as far as the word meaning uh, adoration, explanation of adoration. Thank you, Florence, for that question. Thank you, pastors. We sure do appreciate that. And Florence, thank you for sending in your question. Um, Pastor Columbus, we have um, another question that has come from Richard in Utah. Always good to hear from the state of Utah. And um, Richard wants to know if Romans 13 says that we lose our salvation when we disobey uh, authority. Why didn't Jesus and John the Baptist lose their salvation? Richard, thanks for that question. It's kind of an interesting question. I think it's probably a three-parter, so we're going to move it down. Uh, and I, I want to read where I believe that you're referencing out of Romans 13. In verses 1 and 2, let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities rebel against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment or damnation on themselves. That word judgment, uh, I'm reading out of NIV, and that word damnation comes out of uh, King James, New King James. And so when we look at that, and we look at that word uh, judgment, it's, uh, it, it, the, that word is krino, and it means to commit a crime. And so there's due penalty for crimes here. And, and I don't know where the loss of salvation necessarily comes in other than you would think that where damnation would be, uh, you know, if, if I'm driving down the road and it's a 35 mile an hour speed limit and I'm doing 55, I get pulled over, I get a ticket for that. I just violated the, the law of man. So we're looking at there's a physical law that's established by the governing authorities that got his place there. I deserve the ticket because I'm, I'm doing 20 miles out, an hour over the speed limit. I, I, I'm hoping that won't happen on the way home. But anyhow, uh, we, we recognize that the physical aspect of this and then the spiritual aspect of this, this is not going to send me to hell. However, I'm going to have to pay the ticket. I'm still a lawbreaker. And we understand and we recognize as uh, the, Jesus came and then it talks about John the Baptist. And that could be, we'll move that on. We, we start to recognize that, you know, these are laws that have been placed. Even the, the, the civil laws have been placed by God for our protection, for our guidance, uh, to lead us into obedience. I believe these scriptures really talk about the subjection to the things of God talk about walking in obedience because if we if we, if we can't if we can't do it on on the earth on the planet on the civil civil laws how are we going to do it in the spiritual laws that God has given to us we're going to have a struggle so these two compete maybe against one another but we always follow God's law in this and so we have to be very very careful not to take the scripture out of context and then somehow move into loss of salvation because I don't believe that's what happens here Thank you, Pastor Columbus. Um, pa Pastor Luana, what are your thoughts on that? Well, actually, he really summed it up. I, um, I am wondering whether or not the caller um, is mixing up salvation and damnation. They're not the same thing. Um, so I hope that he got a better understanding from my colleague right here because he really did a great job with explaining it. Thank you, uh, Pastor Williams. Uh, Dr. Kathleen, let me, let me put a little bit of different spin on this as I often like to do. Um, where do we draw the line when it comes to rebelling against civil authority if the law is contrary to what the scripture says? Okay, well, I was looking at Romans because I really like that Roman scripture that they gave. And thank you so much, Richard, for that. It says, every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And it talks about resisting the powers and, and the consequences. Well, I love this scripture because my son became a police officer. And this is the scripture that I use. And there is consequences for resisting the law. And it says, and I said to my son, I said, you know, you're serving Christ as a police officer. It says in verse 4, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, the avenger, to execute wrath upon him that uh, doeth evil. 
And then I came to this other scripture because this is not talking about losing your salvation. I think people are afraid that maybe they'll do something. They're going to lose their salvation. I goofed up. But you know what? We can fall back on this scripture, and I absolutely love it. It is 1 John. And uh, first chapter, it says, uh, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, okay, even after you come to Christ, this word is for you as the believer, right? We make him a liar and his word is not in us. I just want to say that we have an advocate and that's Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is coming. He's our helper and he convicts us when we do wrong. Amen. Amen. Thank you, pastors, for your uh, answers, and thank you so much for your question. Uh, Pastor Gray, we're going to bring our next question to you. It's from Richard, I'm sorry, from Raymond, excuse me, from Raymond in Virginia. And Raymond's question is, who is my neighbor that I should love my neighbor as myself? First of all, we believe that means everyone. You should love everyone as yourself. But let's see how Jesus answered that in the scriptures here. In Luke, the 10th chapter, uh, we'll start at the 29th verse. There's a man who had come to Jesus trying to justify himself, trying to find out how do you have eternal life? And Jesus tells him uh, that in verse 29, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is the one that I should do good to? Who is the one that I should care for? And Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among uh, thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, he came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And, and this goes on, he goes on to tell a little bit more about how compassionate the Samaritan man was. But the point is, is that the one that you have compassion on, that's the one who is your neighbor. And if you should be treating all men as your neighbor. Thank you, Pastor Gray. And um, Apostle Chappelle, when, when we talk about who our neighbor is and talk, talk about how we should love our neighbor as ourself, that doesn't give us the right to exclude people we don't like, does it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And that's the kind of reference in Matthew 5, 43. Uh, it says, you have heard that it said, you shall love your neighbor, fellow man, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love, that is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So uh, those in existence, your fellow man, really your neighbor, uh, that what God has given for us, we give to them. The love he has for us, we share to them. How else will we draw him into intimacy with the Father if they don't see it exhibited through those of us that make that expression? And I truly believe that that is the key to deliverance of many, to be able to uh, uh, entertain or receive the love, uh, even of strangers, that we were created in love by love for love. So therefore, I think that love is the key uh, for the whole thing to salute, so, uh, solidify that entire uh, piece. Terrific answer. Thank you so much. And uh, pa Pastor Columbus, you know, let's, let, let's be honest. It's easy to love people that we like, or people that are like us. Uh, how do we go that second step to love our neighbor as ourselves? Because that's not easy. Well, I really believe that, you know, we were in Romans earlier, and I just happened to look down and I was reading uh, while we were answering, the, they were answering the question. And I saw the scripture down here in Romans 13. I'm just continue down a little bit further. And it says, um, I think I'm in verse 9 here. Uh, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. And that's what we're talking about. The command to love your neighbor as yourself. How do we do that? I will tell you that. Over the course of time, you can only do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it tells us to love our enemies. 
and not that our neighbors would be our enemies necessarily, but, you know, when you start to look at, do you love yourself? You know, that, that, uh, when we look at love the Lord your God with all your mind, body, soul, and strength, your neighbor is yourself. We're down at the bottom of that list. And so we have to look at our neighbor as a precious being that's created in the image of God. And as we do that, and I go back over here to Romans 13, I'm going to keep reading, uh, because this talks about love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. There is the law of love. And the law of love, and, and I, I pull up over here to, to 1 Corinthians 13 when we talk about what is the law of love then. Well, we have God living in us. We're born again. God lives, lives in us uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and God is love. So we uh, have an innate aspect of God's character of love in each and every one of us to love those uh, uh, maybe unlovely, those that we don't like even, but we are called to love them. We had a question a couple weeks ago with that. You know, we called to, to like every or love like everybody. I said no, because you don't like their sin necessarily. You know, but you love them because they're created in God's image. But the law of love is real unique because we go to First Corinthians thirteen and we start to read the description of what love is. It's a lot easier sometimes to describe uh, the aspects and the character uh, of God when we we look at it in this in this thing. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and it goes on. But if we've acted out of the dynamic of 1 Corinthians 13, as God has placed us before us, and we would love one another, what a different world this would be. Because loving those that we go out, we would have such a heart for evangelism to go out to our neighbors that don't know Jesus and to get them saved. Well, thank you, uh, Pastor Columbus, for that answer. And listen, don't go anywhere. We're going to come back. Um, Pastor Luana Williams has the next question coming up, and it's going to be a real good one. You do not want to miss it. We'll be back right after these messages. Did you know you can enjoy total Christian television, whether at home or on the go? That's right, all with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand programming. Pass to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Just for signing up and downloading the TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the TCT app to get access to Total Christian Television. Do it today. You ask the questions, and we provide the answers. On Ask the Pastor, we minister the Word of God as we receive your inquiries. It takes a great deal of time, effort, and finances to produce this quality Christian programming. When you support TCT, we can continue to provide biblical Christian guidance to our viewers. We can talk about Jesus all we want. Put that question in, and we'll read it for you right here live on the air. Oh, my goodness, my tablet is on fire. The next time you have a question and you want to know what the Bible says about about it as the pastor. Your support can make a difference in the lives of many. Go to our website at tct.tv or call us at 1-800-232-9855. You can text to give by sending TCT to 56512. Or you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thank you for partnering with TCT and Ask the Pastor. You know, we are so grateful for your prayer, for those that watch this network on a regular basis, and for those that support us with their generous financial gifts. I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider sowing a seed today to help us continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You can send your donations to TCT PO Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. You can visit our website at tct.tv. On the homepage, there's a give link. You can give right there. You can call us, 800-232-9855. Or probably the easiest way to do it is just to text 
the, the letters TCT to 56512. And whatever method that you choose, we want to let you know how grateful we are and how much we appreciate you partnering with us to share the gospel with our generation. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Well, listen, we've got plenty of more time left in the program today, and these pastors are doing a great job answering these questions. So I want to encourage you to send your questions to us at ask at tct.tv, or you can just go to YouTube, find our live feed, post your question in the comments section, and we'll get an answer for you before the program is over. And that's exactly what Carlos has done. Carlos, thank you for your question. And Pastor Luan, I'm going to come to you with that question. Carlos wants to know, why doesn't God show himself like he did in the Bible, like with the floods and extreme miracles? All right. Thank you so much, Carlos, for your question. Um, God is still showing himself today. And I'm going to give you scripture regarding that. Um, it is John, the 14th chapter and the 12th verse. And it reads, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, this is the amplified version. Anyone who believes in me as savior will also do the things that I do, which is miracle signs and wonders. And he will do even greater things, miracle signs and wonders um, than these in exact or extinct and outreach because I am going to the father. So it had to continue after um, our father or Jesus Christ, the son um, had ascended from this earth. Um, he didn't come here for no reason at all. He came here to leave us with a comforter and that comforter has allowed us to um, operate in miracle signs and wonders. It wasn't here just for a performance. It was actually here for us to be able to heal the sick, raise the dead. It was, it's here for us to be able to um, also be able to fulfill form in the, in the greatest things of all for us to be able to um, convert lives from the, um, from the saved, unsaved to the saved. And so um, we think that miracle signs and wonders are for the um, saints of God and they're actually are for the unsaved. They are to draw the unsaved into the um, church of God. Thank you, Pastor Luana. And, you know, uh, Dr. Kathleen, somewhere along the line, we've um, been inundated with uh, this idea that the days of miracles are over with, that uh, especially Luana said the signs and wonders don't occur anymore. And there's just no biblical precedent for that. So is God still doing today what he did in the Bible? Yes. And Carlos, was it Carlos that yes. called in? And Carlos, thank you so much for taking the time to call that in. And yes, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still is. He said, as, as uh, Pastor said, uh, Luana, greater work shall you do, you know. And so, you know what, I, it talks about all through the book of Acts, all through the book of Acts, Jesus Christ still doing signs and wonders. And I'll tell you what, I've seen the dead raised, you know, it talks about all the things that God may be doing in the past or did. He's still raising the dead. He's still healing the sick. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, Jesus left the Holy Spirit, our helper, and he said, go. And then, of course, there's the fivefold ministry, you know, where to equip the saints in the fivefold ministry. And so, yes, God is still working. He's the same today, and he's still doing miracles. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen. And uh, Pastor Gray, what, what are your thoughts? Carlos says, why doesn't God show himself like he did in the Bible? God does show himself like he did in the Bible, and we just miss what that means sometimes. Sometimes we get so lost in in the stuff that we forget that the greatest miracle of all is a man or a woman who comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They've been changed. They've been made different. They have been, he, God has reached down into the muck and mire of everyday life and changed us, delivered us, made us whole, and allows us to be ones that are convinced that they are going to go to be in heaven throughout their entire life. Now, there's, it's true that we just don't always perceive what God is doing and how he's doing it. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake and passed unto the fathers by the prophets, have in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of 
all things by whom also he made the worlds. And we are a part of the body of Christ. So things are still happening through us if we will be aware of what he wants to do. Well, pastors, terrific answers. Thank you. And Carlos, thank you for sending that question. We have another question that has come in on YouTube. And Apostle Chappelle, I'm going to come to you with this question from Austin. And Austin wants to know, did God know that Satan would become prideful and rebel against him? And if he did know, why did he allow it to happen? Amen. Thank you, uh, Austin, for that question. Um, Yes, God did know that he was going to um, uh, rebel against him. Uh, God, the creator of all mankind, including the creator of Satan or Lucifer, uh, knew in the beginning, but one thing God did not do, he did not take their free will or our free will from us. And whatever we determined to do, that was in our will to do. If we violated the purpose and plan of, of, of Father, then we uh, would suffer the consequences. So nothing, caught, nothing catches God by surprise. He's the creator of the universe. He's the creator of all things. And he actually saw his heart. His heart was broken when uh, uh, Satan fell or Lucifer fell, but it was by his choice, by his will. And you can find that uh, reference in Isaiah and also in Ezekiel 28 that talks about the fall of uh, and falling out of, uh, in fact, in 14, Isaiah 14, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, light, light bringer, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations, uh, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the throne of assembly in the remote parts of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So if he said it in his heart, God read his heart. And that's what caused him to lose his, his, uh, his position in his place. So he absolutely knew that he was going to fail him and, fall, and would us uh, come into his falling. Thank you, Pastor. Um, Pastor Mark, let me let me put a little different spin on this. Um, talking about the fall of Satan and and why God allowed it. Why does God allow any evil or any discomfort or any tragedy that happens on the earth? It's a really good question. Um, we want to thank the caller for bringing that in on YouTube. And um, you know, why does God do what He does? Because His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are high, are, are wider. Than I thought, you know, he's got a plan. I was, uh, I've been preaching out of uh, Genesis 2 uh, about, you know, a garden life, I call it. And, you know, it, he creates this amazing garden and puts man in there. And he knows man's going to fall because he knows the end from the beginning. He's all knowing, uh, omnipresent. He, 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 there's nothing escaping him. Nothing's taking God by his surprise. But we recognize that even in Genesis, that there's always that next, he's got a plan B that becomes then plan A. You know, um, why, does, why is there evil? Um, because man is sinful. Um, you know, we look in the heaven, we, and I, I just love what Apostle said about this, but, you know, we, and, and we recognize that the angels have got free will as well. And so God, not a dictator, God loves us so much that he refuses to leave us the way we are, but he has given free choice and free, uh, uh, the option of choosing him in love or in this case, evil and Satan. And so he's, he allowed that to happen. Uh, could he have stopped it? Well, it, God's a God of principle and pattern. So when we recognize that, we realize that everything is working out and he works it all out, not only for our good, but for his ultimate kingdom design. And where thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're talking earlier about uh, miracles, signs and wonders. Well, the things that went astray and went uh, hayward uh, in, in the Garden of Eden, there was already a remedy down the line. It was Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus to, to take care of the evil and the pain and and the suffering and the and and the separation between us and God. So God's the Father's always looking forward to then making the correction where we have made the the wrong choices, wrong issues in our lives. So why does He allow it? Because He's God and He knows the outcome. Thank you, Pastor Mark and Pastor Luana. I know that you want to get in on this. So what are your thoughts on this question? Well, um, as I teach um, in our ministry, um, God is a gentleman. He's not going to force um, anyone's destiny. We all are given options. And if we choose one road, then, A, that's our road that we choose. Because he's sovereign and or he's omniscient. 
I'm Jimmy all seeing, all knowing. He, he actually knows the end from the beginning. So um, he's not going to make us do anything. And so because of that, we have our free will. And so if we decide that we're going to do or take a road, then the road that we take, whether it is the right road or the wrong road, is, is our choice. We can't say we've been forced into anything. Thank you, pastors. And so the, the essence is, is we have the we have the ability to choose, but we also have to live with the consequences of our choices. Terrific answers, pastors. We really do appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Kathleen, we have another question also that came in on YouTube from Annie. And Annie says, I know women ministered in the Bible. So should women be pastors over a church or is this not God's design? <laughs> oh, thank you, Annie. That that has come up so many times and it it really has been argumentative in so many different areas, but I just want to share with you, because I remember one pastor lady that I traveled with, and she says, I didn't call myself to this, and I remember the day that the Lord gave me a dream and said, Lester, somewhere else is going to ordain you, and I remember sending the paperwork, and they said, no, but the Lord gave me a dream. He is going to ordain you, so I just resubmitted the same paperwork, and he laid hands on me before he died, and I'll tell you what, you know, in the book of Joel, God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That means even your handmaiden, he's going to pour it out. And I'm thinking of Aquila and Priscilla and so many women ministers that were called, that followed Jesus, that supported Jesus, the women that prophesied in the book of Acts, the prophetess. And let's even go to the Old Testament. Let's think of Deborah, you know, under the tree, a judge, a woman judge. And it was a Barak said, I'm not going without you. And so you know what? There's no male nor female. When God calls you, you just say yes. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen. And uh, Pastor Gray, she says she knows that women ministered in the Bible. So does a woman have the authority to pastor or is that not God's design? Well, it depends on how you are defining pastor. Uh, I believe that uh, a, a, a man is to be head of the household. And if the household is the house of a God happens to be the church, then I think that is the prerogative of male. That does not mean that I don't believe that women are called equally as sometimes in greater ministries. There are so many people that I know that happen to be women that are excellent uh, ministers of God doing wondrous and amazing things. Our particular tradition, and I do not tradition over the word of God, but our particular tradition has the household being uh, led by a man. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if I have the final word on that. And, and, and that is, is clear by just by the people I'm surrounded by today who are uh, excellent ministers of God doing great works of their own. But uh, so far, God has convicted me to act in the way that I do. Thank you, Pastor Gray. And, you know, this is the perfect panel to ask this question of because we have three lady pastors. And so, Apostle Chappelle, what are your thoughts on this? Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yes, thank you for that question. I think one of the difficulties that we face in our whole walk in Christ is to forget that we are new creatures. Uh, we are new creations. We do not follow old patterns or the principles that we are one. Uh, when God gave the instructions to Adam in Genesis 1, 28, he says, uh, he told them to uh, uh, be fruitful, multiply, uh, replenish, uh, uh, take dominion uh, uh, over the earth. He did not specify male or female. Paul says in Galatians, there's neither male nor female, a bond of free Jew or Greek, which means there's no identity in spirit. Uh, when we are created as spirit beings, we were not created as male or female spirits. We were created as spirit. We did not tap into a humanity until we came through the womb, which gave us our, our different sexes as uh, uh, male or female. But in the oneness of who we have become, we are God is not uh, God does not separate people. He's not a respecter of persons. If he gives a calling, he gives a calling, regardless of the sex. It's not the individual that's be in being used in delivering the message anyway. It's the Holy Spirit. 
that is inspiring the release of that which God has in this hour. And even when Jesus was ascending and he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, this was not something that we chose. That was something that was ordained before the foundations of the earth. So when we're looking at that, there is no separation. We are not leading as females or men. We should be leading according to the Christ that left the pattern in the earth that said to the Holy Spirit, I will send someone to continue the work that you've already uh, been given. And we uh, we move in that manner. And just to end it, I think one of the difficulties is we try to follow the Old Testament culture and not understanding that not only are we not Old culture, Old Testament culture, we're New uh, Testament, but we're also one in spirit into the earth for one purpose, to rescue souls that are being captured by hell, to bring them into alignment with the purpose and plan of God. Well, pastors, thank you uh, for your answers and thank you for your questions. Listen, don't go anywhere. We've got much more to go on the other side of these messages. Keep watching. We'll be right back. You know, the thing that helps this ministry to be so tremendous are the outstanding panel of pastors. So you stay encouraged. Because he loves me and he loves you. Point people to the Lord. There's a difference between stumbling in sin and staying mm -hmm. in sin. The great forgiveness that God has given each of us. It's an example of judgment. He said, but blessed are those that believe without ever seeing. Let the weak say that I'm strong. Allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you. He guides our steps. He leads the way. All things will work according to your predisposed purpose. And we continue to walk in integrity for the glory of God. And so we need to speak truth. Build it on the one thing that is real, and that is Jesus Christ. Totally fixed on him. And I am resisting the devil. We know paradise is heaven, and we are getting you a little more Jesus. You know, the Bible says it's more blessed to give. God bless you. All you've got to do is ask the pastor. Did you know you can enjoy total Christian television, whether at home or on the go? That's right, all with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand program. Cast to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Just for signing up and downloading the TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the TCT app to get access to Total Christian Television. Do it today. Hey, listen, whatever you do, don't forget to download that app. I promise you, you won't regret it because you can watch Christian programming seven days a week, 24 hours a day at the convenience of your cell phone. And this is only possible because of the partners that pray for us, that watch this network and support us with their generous financial gifts. Won't you consider doing that today? You can send your donation to TCT PO Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. You can call us 800-232-9855. Or you can go to our website at tct.tv, and on the homepage there's a give link. You can give right there. Probably the most convenient way to give, though, is just to text TCT to 565 one, two. And again, we thank you for your generous financial contribution and for partnering with us in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world. Well, listen, the questions just continue to come in and we want to hear from you. If you've got a question on your mind, you want to know what the Bible says about a particular issue, send that question to us at ask at tct.tv or just go to YouTube Find our live feed, post your question in the comment section, and we will get an answer for you today. We can't wait to hear from you. Uh, pa Pastor Columbus, I, I just decided to go ahead and ask everyone in the panel this question. Um, the, the, the question was from Annie, women ministered in the Bible, we're aware of that. So is it acceptable for a woman to pastor a local church? Really good question. And the, the panel, the pastor done awesome. And I will say yes. Um, my wife and I both are ordained. We both pastor. Uh, I'm ordained as an apostle and her a prophet. And 
you know, now that throws another wrench into this, depending on where you are in your doctrinal issue. But if we go to Ephesians 4, and I want to read out Ephesians 4, uh, 11 through 13. And this is speaking of Christ giving this to then the church. And he gave some, not male or female, it says some, apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. He's giving them their order for the ecclesia, the church, to govern the body. And it goes on to say, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, he is charging both male and female to go and do what they are called to do. We're talking about calling. It's irrevocable without repentance. Your calling is yours. It was there from the foundations of the world. He didn't uh, throw this into a gender deal and say, well, only men can do this and women can do that. And if that was the case, how many women have then led people to Christ? Then would that count? There'd be that throw even more things into the question. Uh, but here, I believe in Ephesians 4, because we're a five-fold ministry. I'm really familiar with the scripture. Uh, you know, we are being charged to advance the kingdom of God. We are being charged then to bring the fullness, to bring the unity, to bring the things that it, is, it speaks of fear, bringing uh, until we all reach unity in the faith. We all have to come into agreement with this word. Uh, the, the, I know we have a lot of different denominations. There's like 48,000 of them. And they have uh, a doctrinal issues and doctrinal. But the word is the word. It's plain. The main things that are plain things, and I believe this is one of those things that we can go and look at this and say, yes, Christ himself gave these offices. These are offices to run the ecclesia, the church, the body of Christ. Thank you, Pastor Mark. And, you know, Pastor Luana, I'm sure that every woman pastor has to answer this question over and over and over again. So give us your thoughts. Is a woman authorized to pastor a local church? You know, um, I can't really help what suit I was called in. You know, this earthly suit that I'm in so happens to be a female. You know, my spirit man was called to, to pastor. Um, there was 13 letters that were sent out to the churches in the New Testament from Romans to Hebrews. And these letters that were sent out, they were actually individual. Not one of those letters were um, a copy and so we're, we're getting it to a point to where that we're assuming that these letters are generalized to one church and or every church was responsible for listening to the letters and it was not. Um, so if we were to believe that the translation that Paul gave in the later part of that letter was correct, that means that he contradicted himself earlier in the letter. In the earlier um, part of the letter, um, Paul stated that um, the women should prophesy one way and the men should prophesy another way. So it's clearly showing you that it was translated wrong. And because it was translated wrong, we take that as that is law. And see, God doesn't contradict himself. This is coming from the voice of God. So that's all I have to say. All right. Well, thank you for your answer. And uh, thank you so much for your question. Uh, Pastor Kathleen, we have um, a question from Robert. And Robert sent his question on YouTube. And the question is, what happened to Israel and the rest of the world's buildings and architecture during the Great Flood? Was everything rebuilt after the flood? Thank you so much for that question. And uh, I'm looking at Genesis. You know, let's go to the Word of God, the flood in, in chapter 6. And this is uh, just a little FYI. And God saw, verse 5, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So it just, you know, just to paraphrase, God repented that he even made man and said he would destroy man for who I've created. But, you know, all of those structures weren't even created at that time. But the Lord chose Noah. And so we go over to verse 17. It says, Behold, even I bring, will do a new thing and destroy all flesh. I just want to encourage you because God it was establishing a covenant. And, you know, he says even now this earth will be destroyed by fire. And I think the most important thing out of this story is that we give our lives to Jesus. I have an evangelist heart, and 
you know, we see that the flood did take place. And the only way we can have that renewed spirit and that renewed heart is by giving our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen. And I think maybe Robert has the timeline uh, messed up a little bit there because uh, remember the flood occurred early on and everything was pretty primitive at that time. The the, the great architecture, Israel, all, all of those things happened hundreds of years later. But thank you for your question. And Pastor Kathleen, thank you for your answer. Um, Pastor Gray, we have another question from Teano, uh, who is watching us on YouTube. And um, the question is, will those who don't believe in Jesus be judged for their works? Yeah, they will be judged for their works. They've already been judged and they've been found guilty. Uh, the fact is, is that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because we come short of the glory of God, then there is a, a without accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are destined for hell. Um, so, so that's just a, a reality that uh, people can try to do good works, but none of our good works are good enough for us to pay the uh, enduring wrath of God. Thank you, Pastor Gray. And uh, Apostle Chappelle, the question then is, what happens to people that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? How are they going to be judged when they stand before God? That's a difficult question to ask, or be, uh, to ask and answer, because how can you determine <clears throat> who has not heard of Jesus Christ? This, the, the, God has creation in such a way that because we cre we're created by him, we carry his DNA. Creation will speak to the reality of who he is. It doesn't necessarily have to be a voice speaking in the back mountains when there's no one but one person in a cave, you know, who is still witness to testify. Would God judge an individual who was not in a place to hear the spoken voice? But could that person still be ministered to by creation as it is presented before him? So I can't step into that because that I, I hold hard to that because you're dealing with numbers and we can't deal with numbers that David got in trouble dealing with numbers. You know, I just that's that's as far as I can go on that one. Thank you, Apostle. We appreciate that answer. Uh, Pastor Columbus, again, the, the, the question comes up. Um, Will those that don't believe in Jesus be judged for their works? You think it's possible that our viewer is misunderstanding the great white throne judgment from the judgment seat of Christ? Can, can you address that if yeah, you would? That's what I was thinking. Thank you for that question. You know, um, uh, you know, when we start to talk about works and we start to talk about works-based religion as a means to salvation and then working our way back to God the Father, which we've been separated because of sin, uh, we're not saved by works. It says this in Ephesians 2. You know, we're saved by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works, so no man could boast. You know, when we get to the end of this and, and we, we, we get on the other side of it, we can't work our way back to the cross. We can't work. Jesus has done and completed the work for us. And it's based on our belief. We, those, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's Acts 16.31. So we recognize that this is the way to the Father. There's only one way, and it's Jesus Christ. You believing and receiving Jesus into your heart today uh, is the way to Jesus, to the Father. Working your way there is not good. It says that their works are predestined. There's works that have already been designed based on your salvation. Not unto salvation, but to your salvation. Once you get saved, God says, listen, I've, here's the works I want you to do. Whether it be male or female, pastoring, to be an apostle. I mean, you look right down the, at the line of questioning today, and they all kind of come down to right here. How are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. What do you believe today? You know, when you get on the other side of this, there's going to be judgment. You know, a, a, a point that said all we will all die and face the judgment. The, the beam of seat judgment are those that have received Jesus Christ and are now standing before him. And he's going to say, what do you do with my son? Here's the works that were predestined for you that I, before the foundation of the world, have given to you. How'd you do? And then those, we go to the white throne judgment, which none of us want to appear at, but there will be many there because the word of God says this. Um, they're going to be judged on whether you just received uh, Jesus Christ or not is your personal Lord and Savior, then you'll go into what we are calling before damnation. 
Thank you so much, pastors. And hopefully that answered your question and you get a better understanding on that. Uh, thank you again for sending it to us. Uh, Pastor Luana, we have another question that also came in on YouTube. Looks like YouTube is, is red hot today. And um, Ray wants to know if apostles in the Bible wrote scripture and raised the dead, how are there apostles today? Well, it's needed in the fivefold ministry. Um, I remember um, growing up in, in the church, and there was not any apostles at all. It was only bishops. It was missionaries. And then um, as I became an adult, um, the apostles started to rise up again. Um, and it is actually in the, um, the, the last days. We're not in the last days currently, but it's in the fivefold must. So in Ephesians, I believe, 4 and 11, um, in order for there to be deliverance, one, in the church, for there to be miracle signs and wonders, um, I know a lot of people believe that um, apostles are no longer needed, but apostles are really now um, needed more than ever in order for the church to actually be whole. Thank you, Pastor um, Williams. And uh, doc, doc, Dr. Kathleen, I think the, the question really presupposes something that's probably a misnomer. I mean, all of the apostles did not write scripture. All of the apostles didn't raise the dead, or at least we don't have a record of that. So let me put a little different spin on it and just ask the question, are there apostles in the church today? Yes, and, and it's part of the fivefold ministry and they are the foundation of the church. And I, there are many, many apostles of the church today. So, yes, it's a very relevant, you know, and as you had mentioned, Ephesians chapter 4, there are apostles today still. Jesus the same. And he's, he's literally building his church through the apostles, the prophet, the teacher, the pastor, um, you know, all of the different fivefold ministries, the evangelists. So, yes, there are apostles today. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen. And pa Pastor Gray, you come from a little different tradition, but give us your thoughts on that. Well, we just need to look at the um, meaning of the word apostello is, is the word in Greek, and we need to recognize that. It's just one that is sent. I believe that God is still sending people today so that there are people that are being sent by him to do a particular thing. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, the missionaries and apostles are really about the same thing, that they are people that are sent to a particular place to form congregations of people that would follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We sometimes get stuck on whether or not they are the same apostles that they were, were the apostles of the Lamb. Well, I don't think they're any more apostles of the Lamb because they're not here to touch Jesus. Jesus is not here to be held by them, to be taught in that particular way by them. So I believe that there are those that can hold those titles today appropriately, but it's not exactly the same thing as what Peter was or Paul was. And that's not putting these folks down at all, but saying that they had a different opportunity than we have today. Thank you, pastors. Really good answers. I appreciate those answers. And thank you, of course, for your question. Uh, uh, Apostle Chappelle, we have another question that has come in uh, uh, an anonymous viewer and the viewer wants to know, what does 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 12 mean? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 12. And while you're looking for that, I want to encourage you to send your questions to us here at TCT. You can send them to ask at tct.tv. And don't forget, if we don't get to your question today, keep watching. We will get to it in a future program. So send that question to us. Let's get you an answer. Uh, uh, Apostle Chappelle, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 12, uh, the viewer wants to know what does that mean? Okay, uh, I'm from in the, um, let me go back, it's talking about the new heaven and new earth, I read it from the Amplified Translation, um, uh, but the, well, he wants 12. While you earnestly look for and await the coming of the day of God, for on this day the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the material elements will melt with intense heat. But you have to go all the way up to um, the new heaven and the new earth. The one thing we can't do is take a verse out of context and explain what it means. Uh, it says, but on the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will vanish 
with a mighty and thunderous roar, and the material elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and the works that are, are on it will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people are you to be in the meantime uh, in holy, um, in holy uh, behavior, that is, in a pattern daily, like sets you apart as a believer and in godliness, displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God. Uh, while you earnestly look for this and wait the coming of the day of God, for on this day, the heavens will be destroyed by a burning and the material elements will be melt with, uh, with intense. I think one of the keys in this whole, uh, um, in this, these verses, I was talking about uh, that the heavens are destroyed. It's not speaking of the earth, which is a difference. Uh, we're talking about the heavens. We're talking about the various heavens. We're talking about the galaxies, uh, universe, which is far removed from where we are right now. So the intent, I like uh, people say that the, it means that the earth is going to be destroyed, but, but the scripture tells us it's going to be a, a new heaven and a new earth. So it can't be destruction and new at the same time. Okay, so I believe that it's talking about the galaxies because the creation of God did not begin and end with earth itself. It meant with the, it began with the universes. Okay, the thank galaxy. you. I hate to cut you off, but we are running out of time okay. and we got to conclude the program. But I want to thank the pastors for being with us on the program today and thank you. I thank you for those that were watching that sent your questions, and we look forward to seeing you in a future program. I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider supporting the TCT Network seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We are sharing the gospel all over the world. We're going into homes. We're going into prisons. We're going into nursing homes. We're going into hospitals. The gospel is penetrating areas all over the world and reaching the hearts and the lives of people, your sons. Your daughters, your loved ones have access to the gospel because of your faithful generosity to partner with us. Won't you prayerfully consider sowing your best gift today? You can send it to us at TCT PO Box 1010 Marion, Illinois 62959. You can go to the website tct.tv. You can call us at 800-232-9855. And we want to say thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. And next time you have a question and you want to know what the Bible says about it, all you've got to do is ask the pastor. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. Ask the Pastor is a TCT Network production and is made possible by your financial gifts. If you have questions or comments, write Ask the Pastor, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois 62959, or email us at ask at tct.tv. Thanks for watching.